Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. The 2015 Paris Agreement on Climate Change is on the verge of coming into force much earlier than anticipated. After China and the United States, the world's two biggest emitters ratified the agreement last month during the G20 summit at Hangzhou in China. The third largest emitter, India, ratified the agreement yesterday earlier than anticipated. With India's ratification, the agreement has 62 countries ratifying it and it's about to reach the 55% of the emitters threshold, which will lead to the agreement coming into force. The European Union, which is also one of the larger emitters of greenhouse gases, is expected to ratify the agreement soon. So what does Paris Agreement on Climate Change envisage? What does this agreement coming into force mean to India and the world? Is the agreement fair to the developing nations? And have the developed nations committed themselves to mitigating the causes of climate change adequately? We will discuss all this today with Nitin Desai, member of the Prime Minister's Council on Climate Change, Dr. Ajay Mathur, Director General Terry, Prof. Umesh Kulshreshta of the School of Environment Sciences at the JNU, Sunil Dahiya, campaigner Climate and Energy at the Greenpeace, and Chetan Chauhan, Deputy Chief of Bureau, Hindustan Times. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Mr. Desai, uh, was this anticipated India signing at this point of time? Because there were still doubts that whether we would sign immediately, we'll wait for the year to the end and things like that. Well, it did make sense for us to wait because in our case, the procedure for ratification is relatively simple. It requires a cabinet decision, that's all. It doesn't have to go to parliament or any such thing. So India could have ratified at any time. It could have ratified the day after Paris if it wanted to, except that you always have to have it in Hindi and so on, apart from the minor uh, thing. So I don't see anything particularly difficult and uh, extraordinary, but I suppose they wanted the symbolic <coughs> advantage of doing it on Gandhiji's uh, birthday. So they've done done it and I think to a certain was extent... There, was there pressure on in India after yes, US and China ratified uh, it? Not necessarily because after all the European Union is uh, 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 not. not yet uh, there. Uh, there are many other large emitters. Japan is not yet there. Uh, remember this, that if you look at the list of emitters as of uh, the G20 date, the only two big ones were US and China. Right. All the others are small countries who have ratified if you look down that list. So I don't see that India was under any great pressure or anything. The important thing is not that. It's what is reflected behind uh, this pressure. The whole blame game in the global system. That everybody is busy trying to uh, present things in terms of, oh, unless they do something, nothing can happen. Uh, uh, and that blame game is what lies behind much of this uh, pressure, I think. And I think we should also learn to play that game well. We have not... Are you saying that we have not learned the game yet? <laughs> no, we have learned it, but yeah. we don't necessarily... We are playing it in a... Uh, not, very, not too subtle a fashion. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Dr. Mathur? Dr. Mathur, you know, where, what next? Now that India has ratified it and, it, you know, the, 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 the uh, agreement is on the verge of coming into force, what next? Well, there are two large things and one minor thing that we need to accelerate. The first is all the actions that are needed in order to achieve our nationally determined contributions that we pledged. Actually, we had pledged them before Paris. This is that the carbon intensity of our economy, that is the carbon per unit of GDP, decreases 33 to 35 percent in 2030 as compared to 2005. And the second big one is that the at least 40% of our electricity generating capacity would be non-fossil fuel. And the third is two and a half billion tons of carbon dioxide would be captured by trees and forest cover. Now, to do all of those things, we need an action plan. There is much work that has already started on having those things. I think we are on the right track. As soon as we came back from Paris, uh, the Prime Minister created a group to look at what could be done on energy efficiency. We have seen the targets for renewables. So the process is moving ahead. <clears throat> we now need to see what are the kinds of instruments that are needed to be put in place to make this happen. The second important issue really out of Paris is 
what in the Paris Agreement is called the transparency mechanism. What that means is that periodically, uh, all the countries, including India, would put out in the public domain what they have been doing, what their emissions are, what is their progress towards meeting their own commitments. This is important because, after all, it's our commitments. We gave them, and we need to be sure that we are on track to achieve them. And the third issue also is also what in the Paris Agreement is called the global stock take, that periodically the countries of the world will assess what is needed to be done in order to meet the goal of keeping the global temperature less than, actually much less than 2 degrees centigrade. And so if the global world is on track, but that can only happen once the transparency mechanisms are put in place. So the key issue, to my mind, is one, get the instruments in order so that the policy instruments so that we can meet our targets. And the second is, let's start the process of measuring, of consolidating, and of reporting progress on each of the uh, goals that we have promised ourselves. Okay. Uh, okay, Professor Kulshreshta, this, this uh, agreement yes. may come into force much earlier than the end of the year, we were thinking, you know, it was it was thought that it may be the end of the year or maybe even early next year. But if it is going to come into force, now apart from India, say say big big countries like China, China and the US, are they are they on the track? Dr. Mathur feels that India is on the track. You think that the uh, Chinese and the Americans are on are on track? Uh, I guess uh, they will be on track basically uh, compared to uh, last other agreements which were not successful. I believe this is uh, one of those agreements which will force America and uh, China to follow something. But there is a lacuna in that. There is a no compulsion which uh, only it's uh, your choice how much you want to reduce. So, that liberty probably will not allow to uh, reduce their in land emission, but basically there is other option which is uh, which is uh, to share the emission load with other country. That uh, option will probably help these two countries because they have industry outside, and that will probably um, control that and their emission will be reduced in indirect way rather than uh, compared to this uh, direct way. Okay. Yes, yes, Mr. <coughs> it's an important one. What as far as said, US and China is concerned. Yeah. Basically what is happening really is that we are, the commitments are in terms of how much carbon you are, pro your production in your country is producing. Now if you really want to focus on lifestyles, etc., the emphasis should be on how much is your carbon is your consumption producing. And it is estimated that uh, uh, maybe a quarter of the uh, uh, Chinese uh, emissions are really emissions on the products which are consumed in the industrial in countries. Case, and if you focus on lifestyles, that's an issue of consumption. And we have not done that. We have not made this point sharply enough that a global commitments in terms of the carbon emitted by production is only a partial story. It encourages people to look at supply side options, technological fixes. But if you say, no, we commit ourselves to reducing the carbon footprint of our, of our domestic consumption, it will compel you to look at lifestyle issues and not just uh, technology but, issues but, on the supply side. The issue side. comes in this is that how will you measure the lifestyle because something no, no, china no. is china is producing for us or industrialized countries production is there so the measurement how how the globally this measurement because then a new system of measuring carbon I footprint a, I, I can assure you that there is no problem the carbon footprint uh, but, but there's a whole network which calculates carbon footprints and produces these it is being produced now how do you think these numbers came the numbers I'm, I'm trotting so out. The countries submit their own... Uh... So they're not doing it. Because basically the Western countries, which are uh, essentially have outsourced uh -huh. their pollution, <coughs> have not encouraged this attitude. I think we should be encouraging this. Okay. Then we'll have say... to give our figures on export to the industrialized countries. I, I...
I think there is, a new concept, uh, there is a new concept of supply side management and uh, entire life cycle assessment of the product supply chain, which is a new concept which is coming up. I think going towards those kind of assessments can give uh, figures on the supply side management and where it is produced and how much impact it is causing on the domestic uh, as well as uh, exported uh, CO2 consumption of the country. So th those are the ways to go ahead if we uh, go ahead uh, towards the lifestyle change and the consumption uh, or supply. Well, as far as US and China is concerned, it is said that their targets are not as, as ambitious. Yes. So the, so the you know, nobody's targets are that ambitious. Nobody's, 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 nobody's targets are ambitious. <laughs> there, are, there is a carbon tracker which evaluates mm -hmm. the contribution of countries in terms of how much they ought to be doing if we want to uh, stay the two degree goal. Only a handful of countries are in the adequate category. Incidentally, one of them is Morocco. Uh, where, where, where the next... next we, India is somewhere in the middle. You know, it's a sort of uh, adequate, but not fully adequate type of category. But most countries are below that. Russia is disastrously below. Uh, you know, they're sort of inadequate in a, in a sort of a grand fashion, you see. No, but uh, if you see the Paris Agreement, then the commitments and the NDCs is a voluntary agreement. Absolutely. Uh, it is a sort of a name and shame regime which is <coughs> taken from the MDG, if you are not so able to meet, it? there is nothing no, anybody Chetan, can do. It is, is this voluntary thing. Is, is it because of the failure of the pr past agreements that, you know, they were not, that, that they, they went slow on this and said, okay, whatever, voluntarily, exactly. whoever is agree, going to agree to whatever, we'll, we'll stick to it. No, 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 no it's, it's not failure of that. Well, I, the, the Kyoto... I, it's not failure Dr. of Mathur, that. Dr. Mathur, I think Professor Kulshreshta wants to say something, I'll come to you later. Yes, Professor Kulshesha. I Kulshesha. want to say. Sure. Okay. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, this is volunteer. Volunt, volunteer figures is not failure. It is a knowingly done because, as somebody said, the lifestyle in U.S., basic uh, the energy consumption per capita in U.S. is, uh, OECD country is somewhere 4,500 than oil equivalent. Whereas in India, it's a 500. Chinese, it's a 1,600, three times. So if that is, uh, they don't want to make any compulsion because bringing down from 4,500 uh, oil equivalent kg to uh, 4,500 to 500, so that is somewhere that uh, bind them not to have any kind of limitation but give free liberty whosoever wants to do it in degrees or and even failure, you are most welcome to declare I am not of the, uh, the team, that kind of uh, 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 regulation they okay. have knowingly put. It's not... Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, Grish, uh, the Kyoto Protocol uh, was basically Hello. a top approach which did not deliver on the reduction targets. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, all the countries decided for the bottom-up approach yeah. in which every country gives its own voluntary target and it's periodically reviewed and the effort is made globally to reach the global target. So, this is a new sort of approach which has worked in MDG to some, some respect. But whether it will work in this new system, exactly. Yes, 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 Dr. Mathur. <coughs> Dr. Mathur? Yeah, yeah. See, the, uh, as uh, was mentioned, we have moved from the top down approach into an approach where we pledge, <coughs> we achieve, and then we pledge more so that the global targets can be achieved. Clearly, you know, when you and I make a promise, the chances of us fulfilling it are far more than if it is hammered down on you. I personally, therefore, have a far greater uh, uh, degree of confidence in the success of this, especially when it is accompanied by everybody also periodically reporting what <laughs> is it that they're doing. What that will do is have local organizations uh, pushing their governments to make sure that they deliver on their targets. The central point here is that at the end of the day, as Mr. Desai said, our global commitments are far less than what we need to achieve. And therefore, the periodic ambition is important. As far as the developed countries are concerned, their key challenge lies in how they substitute the power stations, the buildings that they have with more efficient ones. For us in developing countries, the challenge is how do we manage our growth so that tomorrow's power plants, tomorrow's buildings 
are more efficient than the ones that were built yesterday and produce less carbon, use less carbon than those produced yesterday. So the challenges are very different. But what it, the Paris Agreement allows is that each one of us can figure out how do we address these challenge and more importantly, what challenges can we address so that we reach our own national and together the global goals. Okay, but, uh, Mr. Desai, what, what are the challenges? No, challenges, frankly, we have, I think, we, have, we have targets, but what are the, to achieve those targets, what are the challenges? The challenges are, for instance, the one challenge. Uh, we will have to radically restructure our electricity system. Mm. If I have 160 to 75 gigawatts mm -hmm. of uh, solar and wind, it makes no sense for me to back down solar and wind. I must use all that they can produce. If that is the case, my coal-based plants will have to go up and down in the course of the day in order to balance out the do load. How are you going to do are, that? Are, are we going to see less and less coal-based coal power plants? Some plants over a period of time, do they have to close down? In fact, right now, there are a whole lot of coal plants which are back down. Forget the future. Yep. No, I, let me just suggest this. I actually think that the for all most countries, <coughs> what they've promised is relatively easy to do, even for us. We did this low carbon uh, uh, you know, committee report, and that has uh, uh, put down a, a roadmap which actually gives more than this. It gives yeah. close to 40, 45 percent uh, <coughs> reduction, whereas we've committed only 30, 35 percent. Yes. I think, it, think of it like you know, you're teaching somebody to uh, walk, and that person is very nervous. Okay, will I be able to walk? Then we will see. And slowly you start, and this is where the stock taking comes in. And when people realize mm -hmm. this is doable, they may start mm -hmm. becoming more ambitious. And the hope yeah. is that this bottom-up process yeah. combined with the five-year stock taking yes. will lead to a certain increase, gradual increase in ambition that will create domestic ecosystems of investment, uh, it will uh, stimulate research mm -hmm. in uh, relevant areas, which will actually, people will realize, no, it's not that difficult. We can do more. Yes, Sunil. Let, let me come in uh, on the question of power plants to be uh, closed down or uh, no requirement of the new coal based power plants and the investment going into coal and renewable energy sectors. Uh, as you uh, must have seen uh, recently, there have been discussions about India being power surplus and there being uh, lots of electricity yes. and its capacity. Power plants running at the lowest power load factor of 62 uh, in the year and uh, they have come down to uh, 54 in, mm -hmm. in month of June. So that, that uh, points towards that we are building on a huge ore capacity in, in the power, power plants, whereas uh, the growth in electricity demand is growing at 6.7%, uh, which if taken into account in 2022, along with the 65 gigawatt of coal-based power plants, which are under construction right now, uh, that coupled with 178 uh, gigawatt of power plants, which are in pipeline, which are under environmental clearance and forest clearances. Along those with, are the renewable ones? Th those are the coal-based power plants. Coal -based. Along with that 175 gigawatt, if we commit yeah. to 175 gigawatt and achieve that by 2020, we won't need uh, these extra power <laughs> plants. And the money which had to be put in into investment of this uh, coal-based infrastructure to be built, is, which is not required, is uh, uh, by an estimate of around 4 rupees uh, per kilowatt hour of electricity comes out uh, to be around uh, more than 3 lakh crore or uh, 50 doli uh, uh, billion dollars for India. So is there a necessity for India to uh, invest that much in, a, in the infrastructure of electricity which is not required, which is damaging our health, air pollution, water pollution, as well as social and that's an uh, interesting, ecological... Uh, no, no, that's an interesting no, no. point you have made. Dr. Mathur, would you like to respond See, to there that? Are, there are three... There are three Sure. There are three kinds, when you have to look at electricity demand, there are three kinds of needs that you and I have. One is those needs that are on all the time. So in today's context, there is about 110 gigawatts of demand, which is on all the time. Then there are variations, for example, in summer when air conditioners are on, we need more electricity. So on the 8th of September last year, as a country, we needed about 156 gigawatts of electricity. But it was used for a very short time because as the temperatures became cooler, humidity dropped, so did the electricity demand. So what we are seeing is that 
electricity demand changes year on year more people come on to the line more air conditioners are bought there is a difference between the hot seasons and the cooler seasons we need electricity for all of these the base load which is also increasing year on year can certainly be met by coal the problem comes when you are talking of the peak when you are talking of a very few hours on the other hand you have solar and wind which run when the sun is shining when the wind is not when the wind is blowing what happens when it is not blowing you and i still need electricity right and the challenge is mr desai had said earlier is how do i meet that so either i have pumped mm. storage or i have gas which can come up and down or i have battery storage all of those three are either not available or very expensive challenge okay. therefore is how do i create an electricity system in which i can meet this volatile demand at prices that you and i are willing to pay that is the that is the key at the, at the price at which chetan you know this is one of the power is one of the ch challenges what about water uh the paris climate agreement does not uh, talk, talk about, about water, water <laughs> but as you have seen in this summer <clears throat> there has been water spills yeah, in different exactly. parts the cover issues going on between tamil nadu and uh, karnataka karnataka this year have received 8% deficient rainfall whereas the rest of the country has received excess rainfall yes. so water scarcity is one of the issues which will emerge in the coming years which india is still facing but on uh, and the climate change agreement paris agreement one thing is that in the coming years the pressure in india on phasing out coal based power plants will increase we saw in paris that india initially was <coughs> declared as a villain on Are trying to protect its coal-based power plants. Right. So when the next stock taking is done, India, I think, will have to come some sort of a plan or action plan on phasing out or reducing dependence on coal. But the bigger aspect of the Paris climate deal, which is for India, is how to adopt a low carbon footprint economy, how to improve lifestyle of people, mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. to ensure mm -hmm. that people consume less energy, and we can easily do it because large number of people in India are not energy intensive users. so we have we can do much more than what we have pledged in the paris agreement and i think paris agreement is an opportunity for us but uh, more than that the countries like us which the technically they are saying they have ratified but the deal has not been ratified by the senate uh, of us and donald trump has already declared that he will, that he will, he will not agree to the paris agreement so the future of the agreement <coughs> as of mm -hmm. now because the us has backed out of kyoto protocol whether it will back out from the paris agreement or not that, that we will know seen. now that they have already ratified it to get out of it is not going to be no they have not no the parliament has not <laughs> us parliament has not us yeah. senate then okay. it has not the house okay uh, professor kulshre no, kulshreshta no, no, that, so that's uh, okay okay yes yeah, mat yes dr mat talk about this water crisis yes yes mr professor kulshreshta i'll come to you dr mat yes professor kulshreshta yeah. i so, i am re regarding water crisis Uh, yes yes please continue uh, I, this you know i have written already article this will trigger you know migration continental migration people will leave from one place to other place hello please continue we can hear you okay so what will happen the, this uh, in villages already the water table is down now there is no electricity no agriculture then people are leaving from rural areas to smaller cities smaller cities to bigger cities and at the same time polar areas like uh, are uh, for example scandinavian region they are having you know global warming effect so ice is melting and more greenery is there so those people who can afford they can migrate so this uh, i believe the water crisis due to climate change is going to trigger this intercontinental migration okay this is a severe problem okay dr desai yeah, no, no I, one, I, one thing one one point one <coughs> question please uh, I'll, you know address that also are we still going to you know how how easy is it or how difficult it is for india you know economic development versus climate change is we still face that situation i would say that uh, not uh, it's a mixed story if there was a very severe cost penalty attached to moving away from fossil fuels i would say yes uh, that there, uh, there is a price but increasingly we find that there isn't that much of a cost penalty 
So in that sense, you're not necessarily uh, uh, paying a price. Uh, it is possible that the alternative requires more uh, policy effort, more managerial effort than just normally just duplicating. Funds uh, are not an issue. I don't think funds will be an issue, though it is true that uh, megawatt from uh, that capa effective capacity for effective capacity renewables are will cost more. But frankly, today, if I were trying to raise money internationally, I can't raise it for coal. There is no money available for coal-based well, yeah. projects, but money is available for renewable for projects. Renewables. So I'm looking for low-cost international financing, and frankly, the shift will be even more uh, necessary. Uh, what I wanted to comment on on the water, and I, I, we, we are not really discussing water scarcity in the context of climate uh, directly, but of course, the he, con at some point of time, it will become a problem. Uh, consequences <clears throat> will be there. But let me give a small example of how the two get connected. I was once traveling in the Nagarjuna Sagar area, and there, uh, there were some people who got wa water from the uh, gravity-fed canal. And others had to pump the water because their land was at a higher level. Now, the, the farmer who is at a higher level says, why should I pay for the water when that guy down there is not paying? Not paying for it. So, so because you have no water charges, you end up with zero uh, cost electricity for the farmer. And his argument is, we are, I, 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 my land mm -hmm. just happens mm -hmm. to be at a higher level. So I have to pay for pumping water. That fellow is not paying anything. So in that sense, these types of connections are there. So I would somewhere we will have to start looking at, uh, at this whole pattern of pricing of uh, energy, all the energy resources. You can't just okay. you can't just look at it. Yes, in yes, terms of uh, Sanjay, quick, quickly. Uh, not not only on the demand side of side of wo uh, water or the consumer side of water, but also if you see uh, in recent summer there were examples of power plants being shut down due to water scarcity issues, and those were in the regions of. Vidarbha as well as Fraka power plant is another one example. So uh, the increasing demand of water uh, as a resource for these electricity generation capacities which we are going to build in future is also an important point which we have to see and dis decide on be before uh, committing to a source of energy which is okay, highly water intense. Dr. Mathur, quickly sir. Well, the vast bulk of our emissions will come from energy that will be produced in the future. We use very little energy. Our lifestyles, our quality of life is poor. If that has to improve, energy use has to improve. The challenge is how can we improve our lifestyles? How can we improve our quality of life without huge increases in energy? The challenge, the answer to that is using energy efficiently. A LED produces as much light as a normal bulb, but uses only one tenth of the electricity. So, an efficient motor provides the same motive power as an inefficient motor at half of the energy consumption. This is where we need to focus, whether it is in industry, whether it is in agricultural pumping, whether it is home lighting and air conditioning. This, to my mind, is half of the problem that we need to look at. The okay. other half is producing electricity from low carbon or zero carbon sources, the renewables that we talked about. Okay, sir. I think on that note, uh, we need to end. We completely run out of time. But the fact is that that India has ratified, ratified this agreement and it's, it may come into force very soon. We'll wait and watch. But as all my panelists say, but we are on the right track. How the, whether the world is on the right track, the major emitters are on the right track, we'll have to wait and watch. And how this will all pan out when, when the first talk taking play, takes place, we will get to know. Thanks to all my guests. Please keep watching. We'll come back with Andrew in the big picture same time too.